Hi everyone, Kate here and happy Cloak and Dagger Christmas to you. And in honor of Cloak and Dagger Christmas, I have a video for you today on mystery subgenres. So all of the different uh, you know, branches of the mystery genre itself. There's a lot of variety out there. And if you have, you know, not really dipped your toes in or just maybe read one or two, this could maybe be a helpful guide if you're trying to figure out exactly what kind of mysteries you would like. I truly do believe there is a mystery subgenre out there for every reader, and this might come as a helpful guide. So the first mystery subgenre is the amateur sleuth. And this features someone who is not a an official, uh, pri you know, licensed private investigator. They aren't in law enforcement. They are doing this all on their own. And it can make things more interesting because they are constantly coming up against maybe uh, objections from law enforcement in the area and people uh, who involved in the case, you know, suspects like, who are you? Why am I supposed to answer your questions? And so it can be a very interesting dynamic. And I have a slew of amateur investigator series that I like, and that first is the Agatha Raisin series. Uh, eventually she does open her own detective agency, but I think it's the first 15. She is doing things all on her own and isn't working in association with any organization. Um, and often gets a lot of pushback because of that and gets herself in trouble with the authorities for kind of messing with their investigations, even though often she's more competent than they are. Uh, then the Grant Chester series. This is um, a series about Sidney Chambers, who is a vicar, and he ends up kind of working with the local police and he's friends with one of the um, main detective inspectors. And that's how that's kind of his in into investigating things. And then the Her Royal Spinus series, uh, where Georgiana Ronick, uh, she is just a lady of title. So when there are murders that happen in posh society, she is going to be there and kind of trying to figure out who did what. And just because someone has a respectable appearance doesn't mean that their behavior is respectable. And also the Inspector and Mrs. Jeffrey series, of which I have only read one, but I will definitely be fixing that over time. And this is about a uh, Victorian inspector uh, and his uh, char lady or his, his housemate, Mrs. Jeffries. And so he's kind of this, uh, he's a little bit clueless. And so, you know, he's an official inspector. Mrs. Jeffries is not, but she kind of helps him along, but makes him feel like he came up with it on his own. At least that was the dynamic in the very first book in the series. Then um, the Lady Emily series. This is another Victorian era historical fiction. And Lady Emily is um, a widow in the beginning of the series and just when there are crimes that happen in the upper crust of society she is there to figure it out and investigate it and the flavia de Luce books these are set in the 50s and flavia is a girl who starts out i think she's 11 years old in the beginning of the series so she's definitely an amateur investigator because she is a child investigating things so that is a subgenre of mysteries that I absolutely love. The second subgenre is the bumbling detective. Uh, so tales are sometimes humorous and often endearing, said a source that I looked at. Um, and two of the ones that came to mind immediately, which are not books, but movies and TV shows, are Scooby-Doo, um, so Shaggy and Scooby-Doo from the cartoon series, and then um, the Pink Panther. Uh, so those are two examples, and I realized I don't know if I've read that many bumbling detective novels, I love the idea of it in theory, like they just kind of happen upon the solution to these murders. Uh, and Inspector Morris, actually, I would kind of argue, uh, is a bumbling detective. Colin Dexter's detective, he guesses, he usually does one or two wrong guesses. And it's his uh, associate, Inspector Lewis, that is kind of more onto the right solution. Uh, and then again, the Inspector and Mrs. Jeffries uh, series, because the inspector is rather bumbling. Um, and then I do think that sometimes um, Inspector Poirot, Agatha Christie's Poirot, puts on the persona that he is bumbling. He'll ask what he, what other people think are very obvious questions, and he's just really observing the ways that people answer it. And it's all to kind of 
bring to light uh, the dirt that is underneath the surface. And another TV show it made me think of was Columbo and how he always says, there's just one more thing. Uh, it's kind of his catchphrase. Uh, so those are some bumbling detective ones. The third subgenre is a caper or heist novel. These are ones I really have not read much of. And to be honest, it doesn't intrigue me that much because I feel like the amount of information you are given about kind of the interworkings of the crime they're planning is just overwhelming to me. But the definition of it, it says this subgenre places a crook or band of crooks in the role of anti-hero. He or they plan a major crime with intricate, de intricate detail, though it never goes right. So the movie The Italian Job is one that came to mind, but I haven't really read any books like this. I really enjoyed the movie The Italian Job, but I don't know that I would want to necessarily read a caper book. And the fourth one, Child in Peril slash Woman in Peril, kind of an odd name to have for the genre, but it makes sense. Kind of a, a naive woman is uh, kind of tossed into a set of suspicious circumstances and has to make heads or tails of it. Mary Stewart came to mind at the forefront. A lot of times a woman is traveling alone and happens upon these suspicious circumstances. Also Susanna Kearsley's books, uh, and those involve time slips. So you get to see characters from two different timelines. And along with that, Lucinda Riley also has characters from multiple timelines that are thrust into these circumstances. Theirs aren't so much a set of, um, it's not really nefarious things happening. It's more family history that has been covered up and they want to uncover the old family history to figure out their ancestry and lineage. The fifth mystery subgenre is the cozy or another term that I just found while I was researching this and I love it is malice domestic. I just love the sound of that because those two contrasting, you know, domesticity we think of as safe and malice we think of as very unsafe and evil and villainous. And it kind of made me think of Victorian sensation novels, how those two things are contrasted. Um, and so it really, um, there's some crossovers with what a cozy is, like a lot of golden age crimes would be considered cozies, but I'd say golden age crime are different than modern cozies. Uh, but just the first ones, you know, the Agatha Raisin series that I talk about a lot, Grant Chester again, you know, some of these fall into multiple subgenres. Uh, Her Royal Spinus, Inspector and Mrs. Jeffries, Lady Emily, Flavia Deleuze, Poirot, um, Miss Marple, also by Agatha Christie. So the cozy, um, it says it's set in a small town with an amateur, though often highly educated woman as a sleuth. Uh, and the murder is over very quickly and often you aren't even there for it. So that's a big key to cozies is that the actual act of the killing is in the background. You're not really there to see kind of the real violence and the more chilling things. Um, so I do think uh, this seems like an older definition if it's saying that amateur woman as a sleuth, because I think in newer ones, often it is a woman, but that doesn't have to be the case for it to qualify as a cozy. Uh, then culinary, which I thought was kind of very specific to has, have as a subgenre, but I did think of John Saturnow's Feast, which is on my uh Cloak and Dagger Christmas TBR. So I'm really hoping I enjoyed this because I keep talking about it in videos because um, I'm very excited for it. And then Rex Stout's Nero Wolf series. I heard Steve Donahue recommend these and um, Nero Wolf loves to cook. He lives in a New York City apartment and um, the man loves food. So I really want to try out the series at some point. Um, the, there's a TV series that I would love to watch. It has the actor who played Uncle Vernon in the Harry Potter movies. It's called Pie in the Sky, and he is a chef who investigates murders in his spare time. And in addition to that, Joanne Fluke's Hannah Swenson series. Hannah Swenson is a chef or a baker in a small town. I have not read any of these. To be totally honest, the covers are somewhat off-putting to me. Like, it doesn't make me think that the writing is going to be of a great caliber, but there is you know, the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. So that's not to say I'm opposed to ever trying it. It's just never a top priority. And the next subgenre, which is another very specific one, is doctor detective stories. So physicians who encounter and then solve lots of murders. I don't know that there are a ton of series out there, but it was on the list, you know, of a couple sources that I looked at. So I put it on there. One that I thought of, and I've only read one from this series, but is Ellis Peters' Brother Cadfell series, where he is a monk 
um, and a gardener, but he is also the physician for the monastery that he lives in. And also that is how his knowledge that he has from that is how he often solves crimes. And Austin Freeman has a John Evelyn Thorndike series that met, went for many years. I think it began in the late 80s and went through the 90s. I hadn't heard of that. And then, of course, there is Dr. Watson, who is Sherlock Holmes' right-hand man uh, and uses his medical knowledge at some points throughout the series. The next subgenre, which, again, kind of an unusual category, but it makes sense, is fair play. And it says it's an authorial style rather than a type of story or character. In these stories, the reader is offered a plausible mystery, and you have all of the clues. You have all of the information at your fingertips, and you just have to put it together. And so you can be the one to solve the crime, maybe even before the detective themselves have figured it out. Um, it says these stories may be subtle and get complicated, but there are no tricky surprises. Nothing flipped where, oh, you couldn't have had that information at all, or you have an unreliable narrator. And one that came to mind, of course, was the Hercule Poirot mystery. Some of them, you think, I had the information all right there. Why didn't I put two and two together and figure it out? Uh, so I thought that was a, an interesting and cool one, I think, for people who like to feel kind of like they're one step ahead of the detective. Um, Sometimes I feel like Sherlock Holmes is like that, but other times I'm like, okay, that was just way too big of a leap. And then the <laughs> furry sleuth category, which is it, it's tales featuring a cat and sometimes a dog as the principal investigator. Am I interested in reading this subgenre? No, I am not. Um, I mean, never say never. So maybe at some point I would try it. An interesting subgenre was the disability subgenre. This would be the 10th one on this list, and it features an investigator who must overcome physical challenges to pursue crooks and solve cases. I did think of a couple examples of this. One is uh, in Milner in the TV series Foil's War. He comes back and he has really hurt his leg. He served um, in World War II and has really been um, injured because of that. But it's wonderful to see kind of he realizes the strength that he has and how, yes, his life is different, but that doesn't mean he is any less intelligent and um, any less good at his job. And then uh, another TV series is Doc Martin. Now, Doc Martin is a doctor, but they really do make it, there will be kind of medical mysteries. You know, people are getting really sick all over town. What has happened? Why are they getting sick? And um, he also has a fear of blood. So if you're going to be a doctor and you have a fear of blood, that's kind of not ideal. <laughs> but I really do recommend that series. And then uh, Adrian Monk in the TV series called Monk, he has obsessive compulsive disorder and it really does trip him up in some of his investigations. And it's really lovely to see though, sometimes he just really kicks into gear and knows that he just has to overcome his fears at some point and really just works hard to come against the the disorder that he has. And then the 11th subgenre, the hard-boiled. And then also they say that literary is a subgenre of it. Um, noir or tart noir, which is a subgenre name I had not heard before. Now I do take a little umbrage with hard-boiled and then literary being a subgenre because of how they describe hard-boiled on this source that I had. It says, these stories occupy the heart of the genre and feature a gritty, cynical male private investigator in a violent and corrupt urban setting that suits his demeanor. So I would say that, you know, Ruth Rendell and Elizabeth George, um, they, you know, should qualify as literary, but I wouldn't necessarily call them hard-boiled then because they aren't this kind of violent and corrupt urban setting. So I think these are maybe a little too limited at some points, but I get the point of what they're saying. So some really popular ones in that genre, genre it says it was launched in 1920, um, Dashiell Hammett's book, The Maltese Falcon, and Raymond Chandler, Mickey Spillane, Robert Parker, and others. Um, and then more modern day hard-boiled would be Steve Larson's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo Trilogy. These are ones that I'm just not interested in. So like I said, like Ruth Rindle would count as a bit of that. Her, her stories can be a bit gruesome. Sometimes you get more graphic details than I like to get, uh, but I'd say she's not quite, uh, you know, she doesn't fit quite the bill if that's their definition of hard-boiled.
Then one of my absolute favorite subgenres, the 12th subgenre is historical. So it says it places clever detectives in many historical settings. There are so many endless possibilities for this. The Brother Cadfell series that is set in medieval times, Maisie Dobbs, which is the interwar years and then into World War II, the Lady Emily series, which is the Victorian era, Flavie de Luce, which is Flavia de Luce, which is the 1950s, Grant Chester, also the 50s into the 60s, the Amory Ames series, which is the 20s and 30s in England, um, CJ Sansom's Shard Lake series, which is Tudor England. I know Lindsay Davis has a Roman era mystery series. Uh, I think the something pig, I'll put up the cover, of course, you can see it there. So there's endless possibilities. Uh, and, you know, I think that for those that like historical fiction, trying a historical my mystery series could be a great entry point into the mystery genre itself. And the 13th subgenre is the inverted or how done it novels. This begins with the reader witnessing the murder, and then the plot revolves around how the perpetrator will be caught. So there could be, you know, mysteries from certain series where only a couple of these from this series follow that. But I have enjoyed the ones that I've read where you know who did it. Um, and the one that really stuck in my mind the most is Ruth Rendell's Shake Hands Forever. Wexford knows something is up. This wife has died of natural causes. And the husband in this case, what's so surprising to him is that he left his first wife for the second wife. Why would he up, you know, have this upheaval of all of his life just to murder the second wife? He knows something just isn't right. Um, and then the Columbo TV series. Often you see who the killer is at the very beginning of the episode. You even see them doing the act. And then you have to see how Columbo's going to put all the details together. The 14th subgenre is the legal slash courtroom. And this features a protagonist who is a lawyer or court official who solves the cases him or herself while the stubborn or corrupt police are on the wrong track. That is kind of a real trope of mysteries to have police that... Um, police that really don't know what they're doing. And um, I have not read any, nor am I that motivated to read any. Um, I just, I've been so inundated with hearing, you know, seeing John, John Grisham for sale in bookstores and the covers never like pop out to me. Again, don't judge a book by its cover. But often the mystery covers that I do like the look of are the kinds of mysteries that I like. And I think it's kind of a Pavlovian response. Like I have enjoyed Maisie Dobbs mysteries, therefore, mysteries that have that same kind of cover that marketing has decided to make it that way, chances are I will enjoy it. Um, then the 15th category is the locked room or puzzle mystery. So this is, again, some of the Hercule Poirot would you know, qualify as these, but not all in the series. Um, and it says uh, a narrow subgenre in which careful observation and extraordinary logic reveals the means of a seemingly impossible murder crime or escape. Uh, so one, you know, that comes to mind is the big bow mystery where someone uh, they're found murdered in a door in a room that the door is locked from the inside. How did it happen? And um this is one where I have a pet peeve with it. And often I find there is info dumping that happens where like we have to go through every possible, you know, angle to this information. And it just, I feel bogged down. That's not one of the reasons I read mysteries. Um, and yeah, so hopefully A.A. Milne's The Red House Mystery that I had on my TBR will not feel like that. And I'll, I will just thoroughly enjoy it. I like the idea of them and I love to watch them as TV episodes. The 16th subgenre is the police procedural. And this is a really big category. There's lots of possibilities here, but it says that generally the protagonist is a police detective um, or there's a team of officers and they are tasked with catching a clever killer. And the story sometimes will switch back and forth between the viewpoint of the investigators and the criminal as the crime spree continues. And there's lots of other subcategories within this category, um, forensic, futuristic, Nordic, serial killer, stalker. So the ones that I typically like to read are less gritty. They're like medium on the gritty level. And uh, Ruth Rendell's Wexford series, you do get some kind of twisted, uh, you know, plot lines in there, things that are unsettling, but not too terribly unsettling, nothing that keeps me up at night. The Armand Gamache series by Louise Penny, love it so much. 
um, the Inspector Lindley series by Elizabeth George. Those are right on the edge of kind of what I'm comfortable reading. Uh, the Adam Dalgleish series by P.D. James, uh, Inspector Brunetti series by Donna Leone, which is set in Venice, and the Inspector Morris series. Uh, so those are all police. You're following them along, getting to see them work with other, uh, you know, officials. And the 17th category is uh, 17th subgenre are private detectives. This is, uh, you know, features a wide variety mem of memorable private investigators working in many different situations. Um, and so the two that came to mind first would be Maisie Dobbs. She does set up her own detective agency and she's working as a private investigator and also Sherlock Holmes. He is a private investigator and one of the most iconic, you know, investigators out there. And then the oh, favorite, here's a favorite one. The 18th subgenre is romantic and romantic suspense. So instead of a typical, this isn't a romance novel, so you're not going to have a romance style plot line. It says, you know, these novels and series follow police procedural and other genre patterns of the mystery, but there's long story arcs and there's going to be numerous crossover characters. And what sets them apart is a, the strong emphasis on compassionate heroines who are, have agency and um, are tenacious and they enjoy successful and fulfilling personal relationships. And so again, you know, three lovely ladies, Mary Stewart's books, Susanna Kearsley books, Kearsley's books, and Lucinda Riley's books. I just give, sign me up for all these kinds of books. I love it because I feel um, so drawn to the level of characterization you are given in these books. The 19th subgenre is the supernatural mystery. Um, it says they comprise a small yet venerable subgenre overlapping with fantasy. These stories follow the standard mystery format with a strange crime or murder where the villain turns out to be an actual ghost or other fantastic being. Uh, I do, would, I would like to try. There are several series that have witches as investigators and I kind of always think about reading them. And then I don't, but I, I like the idea of it. I think it could be really fun and campy in all the best ways possible. Uh, 20th subgenre are whodunit tales. And I just added on golden age because the description they gave for whodunit was uh, quintessential mysteries. And they star a clever investigator who either travels to or was already present at the scene of the murder. Often there are obvious suspects, but the real killer turns out to be the least likely character as ultimately revealed during a confrontational gathering. And that just screams Agatha Christie to me, especially in the Poirot. He loves to have everyone in the room there for him to show how clever he is at the very end of a book. Uh, Lord Peter Whimsey series by um, Dorothy L. Sayers. I forgot her name. Uh, the Alan Grant series by Josephine Tay. And the Nio Marsh's Marjorie Allingham series. I have only read one in that series, but I think that's generally the pattern that she follows. And then uh, Noir, it says, these works present a pessimistic view of the world and began to emerge in earnest in the 1930s. I don't know that I'm that drawn to, to Noir because I think the characterization wouldn't be exactly to my taste. And then the 22nd category is the spy or espionage one. And John Le Carey is a really popular author who's just kind of, he's cornered the market on these, honestly. He's just really iconic. And um, I, I would like to try his books at some point. I, I don't know that I would like them, but again, don't knock it until you've tried it. Then uh, the 23rd subgenre is just suspense, general suspense. And I would say if there are any Victorian mysteries these follow, these fall under the suspense category. It says, although suspense exists in all forms of mystery, this form can involve a naive main character confronting evil. So also the, the um, romantic mysteries, I would say Mary Stewart, Phyllis Whitney, these could also fall under suspense because there is one person confronting this evil. Um, Jane Eyre definitely, you know, qualifies the woman in white, the Law and the Lady, another lesser known Wilkie Collins, Daphne du Maurier's books definitely fall under the suspense category. So it sounds a little ambiguous, but then once they had that definition of, you know, suspense, um, it involves a naive main character confronting evil. I thought, ah, okay, I get what they're trying to communicate there. 
And also I've heard Victoria Holt's books are really similar to Mary Stewart and Phyllis Whitney. And I would really love to try some Victoria Holt also, but I'm just so kind of working right now on Phyllis Whitney, but I will try some Victoria Holt. And I know several of you have recommended her over the years. Then lastly, and a category, I gotta be honest, I don't love uh, subgenre. The 24th subgenre are thrillers. High stakes and swift action characterize the works in this subgenre, and their plots can often be summarized in a phrase. So I don't know if the, the writer of this website also feels the same way maybe that I do about thrillers. And I would say also breakneck speed. It's just too much coming at you too soon. And I said it before, I'll say it again. Um, I think that often I'm just really tired of the trope of sex and violence against women being in every single thriller I have read. And I've read five or six. And so I haven't read that many thrillers, but when the only ones that you've read all contain that, you get tired real fast. So if you know, if you have a thriller to recommend to me that you say doesn't contain those as mere plot devices, then I'm open to reading it, but I don't wanna to have to sift through them all for myself. So I hope you enjoyed this video. It did get a little bit long, but ah well. For mystery lovers, hopefully it just flew by. And let me know if you think there's a subgenre that I missed and should be on the list. And if any of the ones like the historical mysteries, amateur slews, if you think there's a series I would really like, let me know. And I will be back for another video soon. And happy cloak and dagger Christmas. Bye.